for all your commands are righteous. May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law gives me delight. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your law sustain me. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. Let's bless his name. Let's praise him as long as he gives us breath, for he is great and greatly to be praised.
challenge you for the next couple of moments, next couple of minutes maybe, as we start our praise time and move into our prayer time. Let's start with praising the name of the Lord through the names that He's given in Scripture. We just sang some of them. So you with me? The names of God. How can you praise Him in your own life through the way He's revealed Himself in the Scriptures by the names of God? Somebody start us off there. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. The Lord is our provider. Somebody else. Karen. Ah. Counselor, hand of God. Others. How's he, how's he revealed himself to you? He's our healer. Somebody help. What's the, what's the healer? Jehovah? Roho. Very good. Somebody else. Anybody, any others? Names of God and how he's revealed himself to you. Faithful Redeemer. I heard teacher. Amen. Good. Anybody else on that? Prince of Peace. We get into Christmas names. Savior. <laughs> it is all year long, isn't it? Savior. Redeemer. Adonai Elohim. Adonai Elohim. All right. Let's take a few moments now. Transition. Still on praise side. What's God done good in your life this week? How can we brag on Jesus? He's reminded me these last couple of weeks that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's only a valley and it's only a shadow. Amen. Yeah, he will restore us. He restores our soul. He sets us down in the presence of our enemies. He feeds us at a banquet table. He protects us with rod and staff. But the valley's real, but he gets us through. So that's the praise side of that. 
So keep going in your prayer so he heals from that fractured shoulder. I eat one to sell this. But it is. She's in crackers. Not the peanut butter. God is good. Faithful as we come and go. That's what he's called us to. Uh, I'll let you know, uh, we said it last week, but uh, we've come to the end of our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Of course, Easter's passed, but uh, the church raised almost $9,000 for uh, uh, North American missions. And so, well done, church. Thank you for your faithful giving. Keep praying for uh, Emilio Gaspar as he's uh, preparing to launch a church in the Nora area of uh, Indianapolis, North Central Indianapolis. We have uh, we've sponsored him. We are a sponsored church, a city church. He is one of the types of people who receive money from Andy Armstrong. So keep him in your prayers, as well as all of those who, who will be serving the Lord in missions, thanks to our, your faithfulness uh, in giving. And so we want to continue to celebrate that. I also want to remind you that we want to worship the Lord as we give. We'll have an opportunity to give in just a moment. It's more than just about money in the play, but it's an attitude uh, of just uh, thankfulness to God, of worshiping Him for what He's done for us. And that's the right way to do it. So we encourage you to, to uh, uh, pray as you give that the Lord will take what's received and He will use it for His service, whether it's here at Calvary or around the world with many different ministries that we support. And we in advance give thanks to Him and to each of you for being faithful. I'll also share with you uh, ahead of time, last time I shared it after the offertory, but I'm going to share it with you before the offertory uh, that will happen. Uh, in the worship plan that I received, the, the, the title of the number was Four Hands. So I was being all smart and asked the congregation, does anybody recognize the song that was played? Nobody did. Uh, had the title readily, readily available to them. said, it's called Four Hands. And Paul said, no, I just put that in there as a reminder, a place saver, because it takes four hands to play the piece. But that wasn't the name of the song. <laughs> Showed my ignorance. So uh, what's the name of it? Morning has broken. It's in your hymn book. Page 48. And we'll have four hands on the piano playing this. And the whole reason I started that was just, just, just to praise God with the level of, of talent and skill that He's blessed Calvary with. Uh, numerous piano players who are interchangeable and do a fantastic job uh, on Sunday mornings and the, on the piano and the keyboard. Uh, Jason on the, on the guitar and Zach on the Cushion, our vocalists. I mean, just we've been really blessed in a lot of ways, and, and uh, we're just so thankful for that. Just praise the God that God that He uses these people to help us come into the presence of the Lord. And so, uh, as we continue to worship, we'll receive the offering next. The ladies will lead us in, in, in worship to the piano piece, and uh, let me bring in the message to you. Let me be in First Peter again this morning. First Peter chapter one. So give you a heads up on that. This time, if you'll join me in prayer, ushers, if you'll come at the end of our prayer time. Father God, we want to honor your name. As Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he started with, Hallowed is thy name. Your name is to be honored. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for repentance and renewal. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for righteousness by your decree and sanctification that takes place as we learn to be more like you. Thank you for the promise of glorification that will come after this life. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us today. And that ongoing walk, the relationship that we have with you. Father, if we have any sin in our lives that has not been confessed, we ask now at this time that you would, you would forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That privacy of our hearts as we confess these, these known sins, Lord, that Repentance and forgiveness will come. Father, as we confess unknown sins, we may not even realize what we've done. We, we ask that you forgive us anyway. Father, that you give us directions so that we may live more on you each and every day. We thank you, Lord, that you already joined us in this service. You joined us to speak to us through the music. We thank you that you joined us to be the recipient of our praise. We thank you that you're here today to speak to us and to challenge us through your word. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming to the throne of grace with confidence that we don't have to fear 
being separated. But you, through Christ, are a great high priest. <coughs> Father, thank you for being our intercessor. Thank you for being the one who sustains. Thank you for all the many blessings of life. But we also lift up to you those who are struggling, whether it be uh, marriage issues, kids issues, health issues, spiritual concerns, or there are so many things, job concerns, international crises that, that seem to be one after the other, a world that is filled with anxiety that trickles down to each of our lives. Lord, help us to remember Matthew chapter 6. Will you make it real simple for as you tell us not to be anxious about anything, but simply to remember that if we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, that all these other things will be given unto us. So Lord, we ask that you help us to seek you, to connect with you, to live for you each and every day. We ask that you heal our sick, our loved ones, our, our friends, our neighbors. We ask that you would sustain each and every family each and every relationship, that you would bless with work and jobs that, that are fulfilling, but also places of opportunity to live out the gospel. Father, guide us each and every day. And as we come together at this place we call church, this place we call Calvary, Father, help us to be encouraged, help our lives to be enriched, help us to be refreshed and restored. Lord, as we leave this place, Help us to remember that we are going on mission. For we are called to a purpose. To love you. To know you. And to make your love known to others. So Lord, help us to reflect your glory as we come and go. Each and every day. Now Lord, as we give, let this be a time of worship. That what you receive would bring you glory and honor. That, would it, that it would not be given with any sort of hesitation. But with joy gospel's sake, in the name of Jesus. Father, use these funds to further your kingdom in all the many ways that we are blessed to participate. Lord, we ask that as we continue to worship you through the playing of the piano and the, the psalms of worship and through the spoken word and through the written, uh, written word, or that our hearts would be in tune with yours and that we be molded into your image. May you be glorified all this be done for you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Ushers, if you'll come at this time.
they got done laughing at me after service. Becky said, we actually need five hands. Somebody to turn the page. <laughs> uh, we have children's church this morning. Miss Cheryl's in charge of children's church. So children, uh, if you could, uh, she's back there to receive it. We'd like to go. Again, we're in 1 Peter this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1. Once you get there, you'll flip back just a few pages to James chapter 1. We'll start... I actually want to read a passage to you in James and point it out to you. And it corresponds to what we'll be looking at in 1 Peter. We'll be looking at the idea again this morning. Uh, really, it's three weeks in a row. Uh, started at Easter looking at hope and joy. We'll be re-engaging that, that concept that's given to us here in 1 Peter. But also, uh, we also want to hit this idea of Though we have hope and joy and peace and all those things that God brings to our lives, there's also struggle involved in the process. And that's what God's way of blessing us and drawing Him closer to us. So we'll add an element today. The struggle oftentimes is the Lord's. He allows us to struggle so that we can grow in a relationship with Him. And we'll see that take place today as we look into some of these passages that we'll, that we'll be looking at. We'll start in... James chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, and then we'll move over to 1 Peter, starting in verse 6. I know we're going to overlap a little bit with last week uh, in, in 1 Peter. Uh, we'll move forward to the end of that section. Join me in James chapter 2 as we begin to look at this idea of joy that's brought through trials. In fact, he says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete and lack nothing. I didn't point this out in the earlier service because I didn't think about it at the time, but you know what? In verse 4 it says endurance must do its complete work. You know what the incomplete work of endurance is? Grumpiness. It's when we give up before God gets us to the blessing. So we must endure to the complete work of the Lord so we can show the joy of the Lord as we proceed. But He gets us there through various trials. I want to start with that, that, that concept there, various trials. We've heard it said that uh, we shouldn't judge someone until we've walked a mile in their shoes. Gee, what's Jesus say about once you've walked a mile in somebody's shoes? <laughs> you should walk another. You should volunteer to go a little further. Now, the, the latter is biblical, the former is a classic statement, classic, uh, uh, statement. But, there, but, but the truth is there, isn't it? But we also should, should do our best to try to understand other people. We have various trials. One of the things in my training as a chaplain and as a pastor, uh, and in hard situations of life, we've been taught not to say, is I've been there before, so I know what you're going through. The reality is we may, because of our various trials, have suffered something similar. We may have lost a loved one. We may have been through a similar accident or illness. But the reality is the trials are so various that we don't understand exactly because we don't know all the other mitigating factors. But what we can do is have the compassion of the Lord to love each individual in their situation. What we can do is share some things that we learned as God sent us through our trials to sanctify us so that we can then be a hand to others. But how many of us have really applied James chapter 2 to our lives and said, thank you, Lord, for my trials? How many of us have considered it great joy to go through hardships? Most of the times we ask the Lord to protect us from the hardships rather than to be glorified in our hardships. Beth mentioned it in the, the praise time. Yeah, there's a valley of the shadow of death. It's very real. But it is but a valley and it is but a shout, sh shadow. The reality is, before you get into it, God's already prepared you for it, hasn't He? He led you beside the still waters. He had you to, to, to feast on the, on, the, on the green grasses, on the plains. Scripture says, He restoreth my soul. Then He get gay all up in the valley of the shadow of death. So He starts you well. He stays with you through it. But He doesn't leave you there, does He? Because at the other end of it, what do you have? You have a banqueting table where the Lord has prepared a table in the presence of your enemies and He is guarding you there with His rod and His staff who comforts you. And in the end, what do you get? My cup runneth over. See, the, the, the struggles are there. The trials are there. They're real. But it starts with 
proclaiming great joy. Lord, thank you for seeing me as worthy. Thank you for trusting me that I would stay true as I go through the trials. That's what the Apostle Paul says, isn't it? That you, I'm thankful that I've been counted worthy to suffer for my Savior. I don't know that I've really applied that to my life a whole lot, quite frankly. I, I, I err to the wrong side way too much. Lord, protect me from the trial rather than praise you, Jesus, through the trial. It's just a, it's a way to think. It's a way to look at it. It's a way to begin to understand. Now, join me in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going through the book of 1 Peter. We'll be here for, for several weeks, many weeks, as we, as we go through this. Picking back up in verse 6, and I know we have a little bit of a repeat as we get started, we're going to go through verse 12. So if you'll follow along as I read, uh, verses 6 through 12. It says, You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold which perishes through refined fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You love Him, though you have not seen Him. And though you not see in Him now, you believe in Him and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come, uh, come to you, searched carefully, searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time, what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicated when he testified in advance of the Messianic sufferings and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels desire to look into these things. So we're going to look at hope. We're going to look at blessing. We're going to look at joy. We're going to look at the suffering and the trial. And then we're going to end with this idea of how blessed we are in today's world with Christ having come, lived, died, and resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and how we have inherited things which the prophets could only long for, which the prophets could only desire, and which the angels themselves didn't have the blessing of receiving. As a, as a pastor, one of my, one of my uh, things that make me cringe is when I hear that my loved one became an angel. And one of the reasons for that is because we have blessings the angels don't have. In fact, the scripture says we'll rule over the angels. It says the angels here look forward to knowing and experiencing God in the way that we do, but they're not like us. See, the angels were not created in the image of God in Genesis chapter 1. What happened? He created man and mankind in his image. In his image, he created the male and female, not angels. Angels did not receive life through the breath of God, only man. The Lord breathed into Adam after he formed him. The breath of life. Each of us formed in the image of God, by God, breathed into, into us. We are special and unique in creation. The angels long to understand what that relationship is like. They long to, to, to have that. But we've been given it through Christ Jesus. Now if we go back to the beginning of, of today's lesson, starting in verse 6, we start with, you rejoice in this. It's amazing how many times we come to the idea of joy. Joy is not happiness. Happiness should come from joy. Happiness maybe is the expression of joy. But joy goes beyond that. Can you have joy in troubled times? Well, Paul and uh, uh, the others uh, singing when they were arrested. Weren't they praising Jesus when they were on trial? Didn't they have this joy that welled up from within that could not be controlled by the external forces? See, joy is something that the world cannot touch that is a gift from God. It comes in the presence of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. One of the things I, I, I've learned in, 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 in times of reading and such is uh, about the ocean. You know how turbulent the ocean can be on the top? Anybody ever got seasick? I have. It's not much fun. Get out of the boat, things are going crazy. A few years ago, I got to go uh, uh, fishing up on the Great Lakes, uh, up St. Joseph area. What, what lake is that? Michigan. Somebody help my geography here. Michigan. Lake Michigan. 
That's simple. I'll have a couple more brain moments in, as we go through. Um, and, and so I, I'm up going, going fishing on Michigan. A beautiful morning. We're driving up. I'm me and a group of pastors so I was invited to go along with. And we get there, and there, there's storms in the forecast. We get on the boat, we launch, and it immediately starts raining. You know what happens shortly after the rain starts? The winds. That boat is rocking. I learned this one from Tony Evans. You can't make a... Uh, can't make a horse drink, can you? But you can lead him to water. But he said, Tony Evans says, you, if you feed him salt a mile up the road, by the time he gets to the water, he's going to be ready to drink. So uh, knowing the forecast and knowing we were going fishing on the Great Lake, I took my dream of meat about two hours before we got there. So the waters were rocking. My buddy who organized the trip, he was feeding the fish. All morning he fed the fish. It was the nastiest thing ever. But we did catch a lot of fish. It helped. <laughs> I probably should be telling that, should I? Y'all don't get ready for lunch. Now I can preach as long as I want to because nobody's hungry. You know what I learned about the waters? You don't have to go down very far. About six to eight feet. And you know what happens in the waters? Complete calm. No movement. It's still. See, that's what God does in our lives. We get tossed and turned on the top, don't we? But if we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us through Christ Jesus who saves us, we have an internal peace that keeps us calm, a joy, even in the midst of trouble. Even in the midst of trials, there's an anchor that keeps us steady. And see, that's what, that's what we have here in chapter 6. He says, you rejoice in this. <laughs> Though now for a short time you have struggles various kinds of struggles. But it's for a short time. We have to re realize that the valley of the shadow of death doesn't go on forever. It is limited by God's grace. It is limited differently in each of our lives. Yeah, we will have struggles. We will have various kinds of struggles. And your struggles are going to be different from mine. But we all have them. One of the things that I've, I've been talking about with some of my friends is the closer I get to God, the further away I realize I am to perfection. And, and, and sometimes people will say to you, Pastor, how'd you get to that place in your life? And I'm like, man, I'm not right. You don't realize how far away I am. I realize how far away I am. I sin. I become arrogant. I become uh, neglectful. There's a lot of things. There, there's some things I've quit doing over my life as I've learned to be more like Jesus. I'm not there. But there's a lot of things I realize I still don't do well. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes it's just part of the struggle. We all have different and various types of struggles. And we're going to have those struggles, but the struggles serve a purpose. If we go through the struggle with endurance and see the endurance to its completion, then there's a blessing that continues and that others will see and that will draw people to Christ. For we rejoice in this, though we have struggles in the short period, and short term, of various kinds. In verse 7, you can underline this. This is the goal of our faith. So the genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the genuineness of your faith, that's the goal. Our goal is the genuineness of our faith. The scripture says in a couple of different ways, to be holy, 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 or to be holy as I am holy. Our goal is to be like God, to be like Christ who represented, who is God, and took flesh upon himself represented God in the flesh on earth so that we could see him. Our job, our goal is to be like God. If we look at the things Jesus did, probably the most uh, evident is his compassion. He just loved people, didn't he? He loved people caught in sin. He loved people who were following him. He loved people who were hungry. He loved people who were fed. He loved the great. He loved the weak. He loved those with great uh, potential. And he loved those who could only do a little. In fact, he said, some of the least of you will become the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and some of the greatest will become the least. He loved them all, though. He loved the guy who could take five talents and turn it into ten, and he loved the guy who had two talents and could turn it into four, and he wanted the one who only had one to, to, to come to him. He said, if only you would invest in it rather than bury it. His love was equally displayed and open to all. We're told that all can be saved. All who are willing to call 
for the name of Jesus. That's His love displayed for us. And we should rejoice in this, even though we have trials, so that our end result, our goal, genuineness of our faith, the holiness of God, we make representative inside of us. He said this genuineness of faith, look at his description there, genuineness of faith, more valuable than gold. Gold perishes, though refined by fire. Our character, our integrity, our godliness, our ethic, it's the most valuable thing we have. Because if we're walking with Jesus and we're portraying Him in the way we live, then He's glorified. And His glory is what we should be seeking in and through our lives and in the lives of those around us. It's how the Apostle Paul says, live like me as I seek to live like Jesus. He's not saying I'm perfect. In fact, he says I'm the chief among sinners. But he's saying, as I try to live like Jesus and I'm doing my very best, the things I get right, mimic those. The things I fail, yeah, avoid those. But as I try to be like Jesus, we can't say that if we're not trying to be like Jesus. See, more valuable than gold is our character and our nature in Christ. And that's what we're called to. That's the goal of our faith is genuineness, holiness. It's valuable. The result of holiness is given to us as well. So if that's our goal, how does that affect the world around us? How does that affect our community? How does that affect our schools? How does that affect our workplace? How does that affect our hobby places? What should be happening if we're looking like Jesus, if we're living like Jesus? Well, it gives us the answer here. It should result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we reveal Jesus to people through our lives and through our testimony, God should be glorified. We sing praises, don't we? We sing hymns of praise. What's the purpose in that? To glorify God. We come together for that purpose, to bring God glory. Uh, in Billy, I think it's in Billy Graham's autobiography. No, actually, I think this was an interview I heard uh, with Ruth Graham about Billy. Uh, this goes back, some of y'all will relate to this, you younger people may not have a clue what I'm talking about. Remember DC Talk? How awesome they were back in the 80s? Mm -hmm. You know, mullets rocked well with DC Talk. Um, and so DC Talk was this Christian rap band out of Liberty University. And they were uh, all the rage. And Billy Graham had made a comment about not liking their music. But yet he had them at all of his rallies through the 90s. And Ruth was asked about that. You know what she said? She said, what he does in a crusade and the music portion is, is like a fancy dinner time, dinner setting. She said that the, the place settings, the table settings are the music. And you set the places based on the participants who's coming to dinner. So if you're going to serve the meal and you're going to give them the nourishment that they need, first you've got to have the right table settings and that's the music. Billy Graham's statement was, if they're going to draw people in who need Jesus, I'm going to have them at my crusades. It wasn't about what he liked. He didn't like their music. But he loved their witness. Because it got people there who needed the main course. And the main course was Jesus. So as we go through life, there's going to be a lot of settings. There's going to be a lot of things going on. We have to remember that our job as Christians, our job as Christ. Uh, as, as Christ's people, as His followers, as His disciples, our job is to set the table so that the main course can be served. And the main course is Jesus Himself. It's salvation in and through the name of Jesus. And so we live our lives in such a way, through our testimony, through our trials, through our rejoicing, through our celebrating who God is, as we share with others, as we go to work, as we go to play, as we get up and lie down, Throughout the day, we set the table so that people will be able to receive the main course. We don't have to like all the things we do. There's some, probably some things about church you don't like. We come to this place called Calvary. We call it church. We know the reality is the church is the people, right? There's probably some things about church and this church you probably don't like. There's some things I would change in terms of preference. But I'm not the only one who has to be satisfied. And you're not the only one who needs to be satisfied. But our goal, the idea of unity, you know what it is? 
The idea of unity is that we come together to focus on Jesus. It's about setting the table so that the Word of God can settle in the individual's hearts. So that God can transform their lives. And that He can recreate them in the image that He's called them to have and to be. And in doing this, if our goal is genuineness of our faith, the end result is going to be praise, glory, and honor at the name of Jesus. And as we live and as we set the table so that others can hear and enjoy the main course of Jesus, our goal should be that He receives all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Verse 8, He says, You love Him. And we do love Him, don't we? We love God. I love the testimony that Arnie shared. I just want to, his, from his granddaughter, I just want to hug Jesus. Why? Because he hugged us, didn't he? In salvation. He's wrapped his arms around us and embraced us, even though we were sinners. See, we need Christ and we love Christ. He says you love him, though you have not seen him. Now, I've not seen God in the flesh. I've not seen Christ with my eyes. Now, I've experienced Him throughout my life. I experience Him quite often. But I've not seen Him. The apostles got to see Him, didn't they? It was a unique time in history. And He changed their lives forever. For those who try to claim that Jesus was just a fraud and a fake and the disciples knew that about Him and they made up this lie of resurrection, I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to be crucified for a lie. I'm not be willing to be burned at the stake for a lie. I'm not willing to be some of the other things that happened to some of the other apostles. I've already made you sick on the food. I can tell you some of the other horrible ways they died. I'm not going to. But they were horrible. They don't do that for a lie. Christ is God's Son. He was resurrected. He was seen in the flesh. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He secured our place in heaven for all who call upon the name of Jesus. He did that for us. And we give Him glory. We give Him honor. For it. Though we haven't seen Him with our eyes, we have experienced Him with our lives. And our lives have been changed. We're told that in this changed life that the Holy Spirit enters us. He dwells in us. or tabernacles in us. That's a unique gift from God. That's a gift the angels do not have. They are not the abode or the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. They are the servants of God. Don't get me wrong. And they long for, that's what the, the end of this passage is about, they long for that understanding, that connection that is uniquely given to humanity. God has called us into this relationship and blessed us in this way. We get to be with Christ in heaven for eternity. Since you love Him, though you have not seen Him, we've experienced Him, we've been blessed by Him, we've been given gifts of the Spirit that others can see in and through our lives and should be able to see in and through our lives, which come back to bringing praise, glory, and honor to Christ. He says that though seeing, not seeing Him now, you believe in Him and rejoice with inexpressible and, and glorious joy. Inexpressible and glorious joy. Back to that whole rejoicing thing, right? We have our trials, we have our hardships, we rejoice through them, we rejoice beyond them, and we continue to rejoice. Christians are a bunch of crazy people. If we're living right. If we're living right, people will think we're weird. Why? Because no matter what happens, we still praise Jesus. Praise Jesus for a flat tire. Praise Jesus the washing machine broke down. Bunch of crazy people. But can't you find joy even in the hardship when you're walking with Christ? You should be able to. Because that's what He's called us to. And that's the Spirit dwelling in us. I'm not thankful the washing machine broke down, but I'm thankful that He taught me how to fix it. YouTube videos. God... Ordained them. <laughs> it's the new gospel. If it's on the internet, it's got to be true, right? I'll stick to 66 books. God gives us joy sometimes through the hardship because He teaches us to persevere, to endure, and to teach others those same things. Hannah's learning to drive. I, I got on our Amazon account and she's been putting things in the in the inbox on Amazon that she wants for, for, for the driving experience. And one of the things she put, I was actually proud of this, was a hazard kit. I don't know what she's ex hazard she's expecting, but she wanted a hazard kit. Well, we'd already been blessed with a hazard kit uh, from the North American Mission Board. Sin Relief had sent us a, a, a pastoral gift a while back uh, of a hazard kit. 
And so I took off her list, and she said she said something about it just the other day. Uh, she was going to do her, her, her driving, and uh, she said, what well, happened to the hazard camp? I said, honey, there's one in the trunk. Really? She went, she opened the trunk, and she looked in it, make sure everything was there. You know, God prepares us in advance for the things that are going to happen. He prepares us so that when the things happen, we can give Him blessings and joy and, and, and admiration and, and adoration and all those things that, that we need to do. We need to be thankful, even in the midst of it, because He hasn't left us. He hasn't abandoned us. He is still there. Sometimes we turn our back on Him. I, I struggle with this sometimes. Anybody ever turn your back and walk a few steps to see how far you can get away from God before it jerks you back? It's like your dog on a leash. You know, you got one of those things that, that come in and out. They like to get as far away as they can. Sometimes we do that with God, don't we? Now, I believe in eternal security. I believe in what's saved, all we say. Make no bones about it. I think when, once we're in God's hands, according to the Scriptures, nothing can get us out of there. I love that aspect of God, that He loves me enough not just to save me, but to keep me. For glorification. That's a great thing, isn't it? But that doesn't mean we don't wander. It doesn't mean we don't get hurt. It doesn't mean we don't struggle. It doesn't mean we don't stray. The cool thing is we never get too far away. He's always there for us as we come back to Him. Let's get back into the Word here. Verse 8, you love Him though you do not see Him. And even though not seeing Him now, you believe in Him. You rejoice with inexpressible. Our joy doesn't always make sense. But it is glorious when we rejoice even in the midst of struggles and trials. Even when we Rejoice in the good times. Verse 9, because you are receiving the goal of your faith. So I said the goal of our faith was genuineness. It was holiness. He says here the goal of our faith is the salvation of our souls. Well, how do we become holy? By being saved. It's not by the works we do. According to Ephesians, it's by grace that we're saved. Through faith in Jesus. Man, we, we, we got no part of it. Except the receiving of Jesus. I'm not sure the accepts the right word. In the receiving of Jesus, we are saved. He did the work of salvation. He went to the Christ cross. He extended the gift. We have the privilege of receiving it. And as we receive it, the scripture says we are saved. And it's a glorious expression of his love for us. It's the end result of that gift. It's the salvation of our souls. And we should rejoice in this. By the way, no matter how bad life gets, and I know some of you say it can't get any worse. I can appreciate that. I can empathize with you. I've never been there. I praise Jesus for that. Let me tell you this. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're going to heaven. And in that, in that alone, you should rejoice. Regardless of everything else, get six feet under in the ocean where it's calm and peaceful and rejoice. The Holy Spirit has protected your soul. Rejoice. If in nothing else... And the fact that God will never leave you or forsake you. Your situation may be difficult. Yes, I agree. But God will not leave you or forsake you. And He will get you through to the end. He will complete the good work He began in you. He doesn't mess up. If He called you, He called you for a purpose. You serve a purpose. You have a gift. You have a usefulness. And you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now we want to get into verse 10 through 12 here. It's a simple prospect. He uses a lot of words to get you there. But I want you to understand how blessed we are. He starts with, concerning this salvation. What is this salvation? It's the salvation of your souls. Is, the, is Jesus uh, receiving you, are you as you receive Him? His saving you? His sustaining you? And His glorifying you. This salvation is the completion from beginning to end. says the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. Uh, uh, the grace that would come to you, they searched and carefully investigated. The prophets were looking for the Messiah. They were looking forward to the completion of the visions they received. God was revealing Himself to them for a future time. For us. And they longed for it. Jesus refers to John the Baptist as the greatest of the prophets. You know what happened in John the Baptist's life? He was beheaded before Jesus died and rose again. We have something that even as Jesus referred to him as the greatest of the prophets, did not have. We have something that was not even given to John the Baptist. We have the knowledge of the resurrected Savior. 
we have the implanting of the Holy Spirit. We have a walking daily, ongoing, irreversible. Go back to, to Romans. Not height or depth. Not principality or authority. Nothing can remove us from the love of our Father. It's a guarantee. He's loved us that much. Nothing can take us away from Him. The prophets longed for that. They saw it coming through their visions. They studied it and they proclaimed it. But they didn't have it. We have been blessed that we have not seen Him with a glorious and inexpressible joy because Christ dwells in us. This is huge. Everybody before Christ wanted it. Now, I'm not saying they weren't saved and they don't get to go to heaven. According to Hebrews, it says that they were saved in faith looking forward to Christ. But this is the thing. We're saved in Christ with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have His presence today. We don't have to wait till the end. It starts at salvation and goes on for eternity. They carefully investigated. Verse 11, they inquired when it was going to happen and what circumstances the Lord would use to bring about the Spirit of Christ within them. And he testified in advance to what Christ would suffer and the glories that would follow. Then we get to verse 12. And it was revealed to those prophets, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. Now, I don't want you to miss the importance of this. The prophets may not have had everything we have today in the sense of knowing the Holy Spirit in a, in a permanent indwelling. Now, I'm not saying they weren't led by the Spirit. They prophesied through the Spirit. Absolutely. There's a difference in that in the indwelling of the Spirit. Now, here's the thing. They recognized the gift of God was not just for them, but for them to share with others. It was their preparation of those to come. Let me tell you this. We got the greater gift. We don't just have the knowledge of God. We've got the indwelling of God. And so the gift that we have received, which is a greater gift that we have not seen Him, we have loved Him, we must share that with others. We must use the love He's granted us, the knowledge He's granted us, the peace He's granted us, and share it with others. We need to do just like the prophets did and realize it wasn't for us, but it's for somebody else. It's for our next generation. It's for our grandkids who need to hug Jesus. It's for our neighbor who needs to know Jesus. If your neighbor knows Jesus, he'll do weed control. If your neighbor knows Jesus, he won't park on the road right in front of your driveway. Right? All these things we get so upset about in life. That's not what it's about at all. You know what it's about? It's just simple faithfulness. It's about helping others become who God wants them to be, not who we want them to be. You know, it's that, it's that, it's that mystery and key to parenting. Not having your child become who you think they should be, but helping them become who God has created them to be. It's difficult, but it's the right thing. It's not about the circumstances of life and those little pet peeve issues. It's about the glory of God and eternal issues. By the way, what sin was it that Jesus could not forgive? Oh yes, that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the rejection of God. Everything else was forgivable. The woman caught in adultery. Forgivable. Right? Those who were preaching or casting out demons in the name of Jesus but weren't a follower of Jesus, what's he say? If they're not against me, then they can't later come back and condemn me if they're operating in my name. He didn't condemn them. He used hope. He used peace. Now, he absolutely called, was, had a call to righteousness. He had a call to obedience. Every sin that came before Jesus was forgivable. Every sin was forgivable. What did Jesus always say at the end of that conversation? Now, go and sin no more. I love you. It's compassion. That's why he's preaching. That's why the, the prophets are predicting. It's the coming of the Messiah who will set all things right before God for those who will believe in Jesus. But it's not just the prophets. These things have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These things, 
that you're hearing today, these things that we've heard from the prophets in the past, have now been announced to you. You, you. you hear them by those who preach the gospel. That word preach, by the way, you know what it, you know what it means? Proclaim. It's not just for the guy with the collar on or the tie and the suit or the shirt without a suit and tie. It's not for the guy who stands at the front. It's for every one of us to proclaim Jesus. Those who proclaim Jesus are the bearers of good news. We're the gospel givers. And we're sent by the Holy Spirit, from, or the Holy Spirit from heaven is sent to us. The gospel is preached through us. And then he ends with a simple statement that I think means so much. The angels desire to look into these things. I don't think they understand the indwelling of Christ through the Holy Spirit. But the angels want to look into these things. How is God doing that? How is he bringing peace to the life of Job? How is he bringing peace to the life of Roger? How is he bringing peace to your life? It may not make sense because they never experienced it. You know what? It may not make sense to your neighbor if they never experienced it. But if you live it out before them and share the grace of God with them, maybe, just maybe, there's hope that they'll receive Jesus. I love uh, the light bulb guy. Help me out. Who made the light bulb? Thomas Edison. Not Einstein. I knew I was going to be wrong because that's the only name coming to me. I told you I'd have another moment. Thomas Edison. When he was making the light bulb, you know how many times he failed? Thousand. You know what he said? He said, I didn't fail at all. I just can't find out one more way it doesn't work. <laughs> to not try is failure. To try, we have to live it out. The pastor, they may not listen to me. Well, that's okay. If you do it in love and compassion, they'll see your heart. Maybe you're getting them one step closer. Maybe God's using you to get them one step closer. You know, Paul deals with this with Apollos. You know, there's a faction out there who love to split the church. You, you ever been in a church where there's a faction that love to split the church? Most, most churches have those factions. There's a faction out there that, that got in Paul's face, they got in Apollos' face, and they're trying to play the two against each other. If you don't know, go back and read Acts. Apollos was uh, a greater preacher than Paul, actually, more eloquent. And they're trying to say, uh, pit him against one another. Well, he's doing this, and you're doing this. And you know what Paul says? Y'all quit that. He says, he plants and I water, or I plant and he waters. It doesn't matter because God does the harvest and he gets all the glory. We're working together. It doesn't matter if you share with your neighbor and they get saved, or you share with your neighbor and then somebody else shares with your neighbor and your neighbor gets saved. The end result is what? Your neighbor gets saved. And that's where God gets glorified. But you know how your neighbor will never get saved? If nobody ever proclaims the gospel to them. It's got to start somewhere. Who's your neighbor? Jesus got asked that question, didn't he? Jesus told a story when he was asked the question of the neighbor. The story of the Good Samaritan. You think I'm going to preach on that, don't you? I'm never going to get done. you got to look that one up. The end result of the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus says, well, who is his neighbor? The one who helped him. If you want to be a good neighbor, what do you do? You live the gospel. You live the Christ-honoring testimony. I know I haven't given you a lot of how-tos this morning. But I want you to understand the end result is simply this. That our lives glorify God. That we become holy as He is holy. That our faith is genuine. In the flesh, our faith will never be perfect. The question is not the perfection of faith in the flesh. In the spirit, God will make us perfect and has made us perfect. But living our life in the flesh is the genuineness of our faith. The question is... Are you seeking Jesus above all else? As you seek Jesus, are you living him out above all else? What are we told in Revelation? I didn't know this before in the 8 o'clock service. I had to ask. There are three things God says. If you ask, you will. If you seek, if you knock, I forgot one of the three in the 8 o'clock service. Somebody had to help me after service. I was told it's ask, A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. You will find uh, uh, doors.
door will be open. Uh, the Lord's there for us. What do we have to do? We have to be in the journey of our lives to honor God and become like Him. It's really that simple. What's this passage about? It's about hope that often comes through the struggle and joy and rejoicing is how we honor God in the midst of daily life. It starts with knowing Jesus. A gift that we've received, an opportunity to a gift that we've received that even the prophets and the angels don't understand. They were seeking the understanding of. But we are blessed that though we have not seen Him in the flesh, we can interact with Him on a daily basis through His Spirit who dwells in us. And we have an inexpressible and glorious joy because of that. Have you received the joy of Christ? Have you received the forgiveness of your sins? Have you been made new and whole? If not, are you willing to receive Jesus today? He died for you just like He died for me. The Scripture says it's, it's as simple as believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for all who will believe. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you received the reward of your faith an inexpressible and glorious joy? If not, will you do so today? If you're already in Christ Jesus, will you commit or recommit yourself to living out that expression of your faith daily so that others may see and inherit that goodness of God through your witness, through your testimony, and through your life. Church, we need to respond to God. We need to share and show that joy, that inexpressible joy that comes in salvation, in the salvation of souls, in right living, in godliness and compassion, and all those gifts that God gives us through the Spirit. As we implement that daily in our life, we need to express it through our joy. And we're going to come to a song in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to sing. As we stand and sing, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. The altars are going to be open. And if you need to do business with God, won't you come? If you need to, to express and to share with, with me or the congregation that you've received Jesus, won't you come? If you need somebody to pray with you, maybe to help you through that process of understanding what that means, come and grab my hand and say, Pastor, I need to know Jesus. We want to be able to, to give you that gift or to share with you in that gift of God knowing Christ and knowing that joy. Each of us now has an opportunity to respond as God lays on earth. Let's pray together. Father God, we do love you. We thank you. We thank you that we have the privilege of being in your house. We thank you for the privilege of having Scripture before us. Scripture that teaches us absolute truth. Scripture that calls us into relationship and into your presence. Father, we thank you that today and any day and every day and all day long, for anybody who will, for all who will, for whosoever will, they can come to Jesus. They can be saved. They can be guaranteed eternal life in heaven. We ask this morning that if there are any among us, that today they'll make that commitment. That they'll say, Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Come and live in my heart, and I declare myself your child. I receive your gift of salvation, and I choose to follow you from this day forth. Father, for those who walk with you in faith, we ask that you'd help us to commit and recommit. If we have sin, to, to confess our sin and repent of it. That we might be useful in your kingdom's work. That we might show compassion on those around us. That we might be able to express the joy of knowing Christ. That others might find him as well. Use us, Lord, to do your will. To be a part of your calling, your mission. Lord, now as we respond, we ask that you would receive all the glory for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, you'll stand with me. We're going to sing. If you need to respond, we'll be here to come to receive it. Cheers.
Jesus.